uh, a very important session, uh, which is, uh, I'm going to hand over to you for that, uh, to John Bew, as, uh, who you'll know uh, uh, from uh, King's, but also currently on loan uh, to uh, Number 10 Downing Street. John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me OK? Excellent. I think we're just waiting for Ian V to turn, uh, to turn Neil on the screen. If you can say, there he is. Um, excellent. Uh, well, well, welcome, uh, Professor Ferguson, to uh, a virtual event at King's College London. I hope you can see everything in the room OK? Yes, I can, Professor Bew. Excellent. Very Excellent. nice to see you. Um, now, you, ha you have Neil's um, um, uh, truncated, but nonetheless very kind, uh, uh, biography. But just for uh, a memory refresh, he is the Millbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, not Institute, as you uh, 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 insist uh, uh, correctly. Uh, also still a, a member of the faculty at the Belfer Centre uh, at Harvard. Um, the most impressive thing about Neil, he has a very uncanny and rather alarming ability to write books um, that very much capture the zeitgeist. And sadly, his last book in 2021 was called Doom, the Politics of Cat Catastrophe, which suggests Neil uh, may have kno known a little bit more about uh, the events of the uh, six 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 Exceeding uh, 18 months and perhaps he should have done. Um, so our job in this session really, and I hope to bring in the audience, uh, and it's good to see so many uh, uh, friends and colleagues in the audience, both from, both from government uh, and also from uh, the academic life, is to try and um, elevate the discussion. I don't mean elevate in terms of getting away from uh, the previous quality sessions, but I mean elevate in terms of the scope and the range uh, and the context in which we're talking about the events in Ukraine. So what do they mean, broadly speaking, for the structures and contours of the international order? And how should we think about those events in Ukraine and the associated events and the, the broader crisis of European security in a, in a historical context? And where does it sit along the historical continuum? So I'll, I'll do so by asking uh, Neil a series of questions. And I will studiously deflect anything he asks back of me. Um, and I will open it up, ladies and gentlemen, to the audience uh, about, with about sort of 20 minutes to go. And we have 45 minutes for this session. I have not given Neil much prior warning as to the questions um, we might ask. But I have given him some prior warning to the first question. Um, and I think it is a fair question to ask of a historian who's written, thought about global geopolitics, uh, who's written, thought about conflict and war. Uh, and it's a question, I think, in government that we asked ourselves very much in the early phases of the conflict. Um, because oftentimes you have events in global history, events in European history, uh, where our media sort of rushes to tell a story that something is the most unprecedented or the most shocking. Uh, and then the, 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 the mental focus and the political focus dissipates and goes elsewhere beyond that. I think we are already past that stage vis-a-vis -vis the events in Ukraine. But I wanted to ask Neil, and this is the question I gave him prior warning of, which is how big or transformative an event is Putin's decision to invade Ukraine? Or is it, to paraphrase someone else in history, uh, too soon to tell? Neil, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, John. And it's a pleasure to be with you all, albeit virtually. Uh, I'm afraid I won't be able to get to London until uh, June. Uh, let me uh, suggest that, and I'll just have to tweak my own volume settings or I'm going to hear myself rather disconcertingly. Let me suggest that uh, at this point, uh, it's not one of, of history's big wars, uh, the one that has uh, been raging for, what, 10 weeks uh, in Ukraine. Uh, just as a COVID-19 uh, hasn't been one of the really big pandemics in history, one of the arguments I tried to make in, in Doom was that we have a, a problem with orders of magnitude when it comes to disasters, whether natural or man-made. We, we struggle a bit to, to grapple with power law distributions. Uh, World War II uh, was an absolutely vast conflict. Today uh, in Moscow, President Putin tried desperately to relate what's currently going in uh, going on in Ukraine to World War II, but it's it's a huge stretch uh, given the vast scale of World War II and the relatively limited scale of this so-called special military operation 
I think the, the unknown uh, at this point is is whether this war fizzles out uh, or escalates. And that we don't know, John. Uh, there's a general assumption, which uh, I have uh, friends who share, Francis Fukuyama, Elliot Cohen, that Ukraine is winning and it's all going to end uh, quite happily. Uh, there are people in the US administration who think not only that Ukraine is winning, but that uh, this can lead to regime change in Russia and all other kinds of good things. I think it's much too early to be confident about that. As both uh, Bill Burns and Henry Kissinger said at a Financial Times event uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, we are dealing here with a nuclear armed power. And it seems unlikely to me that Putin is going to accept conventional military defeat uh, when he has a nuclear option. We certainly can't rule out the nightmare scenario uh, that he resorts to using a tactical nuclear weapon to salvage the situation. So let me answer the question with two possible outcomes. Outcome one is it's the 1970s, and this is 1973 only, somewhat more protracted. In other words, it's like the uh, unsuccessful Arab attack on Israel of October 1973, which had, of course, profound consequences, uh, economic as well as geopolitical. Option number two is it's much worse than that. And it turns out actually to be the first time that a nuclear weapon has been used since 1945. I'd still say my base case is the 1970s, but it's certainly too early to rule out the 1940s nightmare scenario. And I just wish more people in the US and, and indeed in the UK uh, were worrying about that because I, I believe the situation uh, in Ukraine is much more dangerous than is conventionally portrayed in the media and by some government spokesmen. Uh, thank, thank you, Neil, for a, a, a bracing uh, opening response. And you've, 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 you've put down a few markers as to where um, I'd like to take the conversation. You mentioned a few people who've been prominent um, uh, exponents of certain theories about the war, those associated with, with prior crises, Elliot Cohen, uh, Francis Fukuyama, Henry Kissinger. And I'd like to come back to um, all of those individuals in a different way is to tease out some of what you said. But just to follow up um, very quickly in the context of the Victory Day parade in Moscow today, and it's another question for a historian, but a, 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 I think an important one as to reflecting on this, on, on, on this crisis. On, on, in the early um, uh, uh, concept or thinking about a Russian invasion, a lot of emphasis was placed on speed. Uh, and speed of action and the agility and swiftness of the Russian forces and a lot of expectation that they would be able to achieve um, what they wanted to achieve um, very swiftly. What subsequently transpires is that a lot of the uh, training um, um, uh, weaponry, which seemed you know, broadly quite limited in that, or those early phases of the conflict, actually gave Ukraine more of an ability to defend itself against the initial spurt of invasion. And now we are entering a sort of second or, or third phase of the war in which um, a, a sort of new pattern has established itself and Kiev for the moment looks um, relatively safe. So my, my question to you in the context of today's events is, presuming that we're still talking about a uh, conventional conflict, on, on whose side is time? Uh, you've got these lo larger um, um, uh, Russian military forces, but you've got a Ukraine that's being armed more and more effectively, has seemingly more and more friends in the West, and cr crucially, I think, and more than anything else, and I'll come back to this in a moment, um, has more full square support for the United States than seemed necessarily likely in the early phases of the conflict. So on whose side is time based on the current correlation of forces? Well, John, you are in many ways better placed than I am to answer that question. And I want to uh, make it clear that I approach such questions as a, an academic uh, with humility. I don't have access to classified information, only open source intelligence. With that caveat, time is clearly not on Vladimir Putin's side. Uh, and this is something that almost nobody foresaw, including me. I, I got the outbreak of war right. I predicted on January the 2nd, war is coming. And I consistently said that we should take Putin seriously and literally. 
about his intention to alter uh, the status quo and challenge Ukraine's uh, bid to become an independent uh, democracy outside the Russian sphere of influence. But my assumption was that if he did launch an invasion, uh, it would go far better uh, for Russia than it has. And that was because I underestimated the extent to which uh, the provision of, of Western and not only Western equipment, Turkish drones and Western training and constant conflict in the east of Ukraine since 2014 had together raised the game of the Ukrainian army. And I also overestimated the Russians, failing to see just how poorly prepared this special military operation actually was. The most staggering feature of the last uh, 10 weeks has been the devastating losses that have been inflicted on the Russian invasion force, uh, which in the space of weeks, of 10 weeks, uh, exceed the losses suffered by the Red Army in the entire 10 years of their campaign in Afghanistan after 1979. I don't think anybody saw that coming. Uh, indeed, even the people I've spoken to who were involved in training the Ukrainians didn't expect that any more than we expected uh, Volodymyr Zelensky to emerge as a Churchillian figure, an authentically heroic uh, leader in time of war. Uh, who saw that coming? considering that the man had, had played the part of an ordinary guy who becomes president in a sitcom, and while entertaining, showed very little sign prior to the outbreak of war of, of truly historic uh, greatness. So nobody really anticipated this. The critical point when one looks forward is the impact of sanctions on Russia's ability to sustain this war. As we continue to arm Ukraine and supply higher level weaponry. We've, we've moved beyond uh, stingers and javelins over the last uh, several weeks. At the same time, the sanctions imposed on the United by the United States and its allies on Russia are eroding the capacity of Russian industry to manufacture sophisticated weapon. Unlike the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation relies very heavily on sophisticated imported components uh, to manufacture its armaments. And Russia is running out, if it hasn't already run out, of 21st century weaponry. It's already increasingly fighting a 20th century war against uh, 21st century uh, uh, defenders. Uh, so I think from uh, Putin's point of view, the situation is an extremely uncomfortable one. He can't easily uh, scale up Russia's military capability without throwing into the fight raw recruits with barely any training and anachronistic weaponry. Uh, so I'm somewhat skeptical that he can sustain the war. Many people are writing that this war is going to drag on for a long time. Uh, but I'm skeptical about that, actually, because I don't think uh, Russia can do more uh, than try to get its Donbass uh, offensive to something like a respectable conclusion and then seek a ceasefire relatively imminently, unless, as I said earlier, Putin decides uh, to escalate by using chemical or potentially nuclear weapons to try to extricate himself from a dangerous situation. And let me add one final point, John, it's very important. Armies uh, don't gently uh, lose wars. Uh, the time of defeat is a time when the morale of an army, its ability to continue to fight, collapses. And my great concern at the moment is that in rushing into another offensive after the failure to take Kyiv, uh, the Russian military is overstretching itself, particularly after the casualties that they've suffered, and could in fact begin to unravel uh, if they encounter really effective resistance and even counterattacks from the Ukrainian side, which is what we're seeing. The offensive uh, is grinding to a halt, just as it did in, its first, in the first phase of the war. The thing to watch is whether the morale of this Russian force uh, begins to, to crumble. And then we, I think, enter the moment of maximum danger when Putin is confronted with a choice uh, between defeat and escalation. Neil, that was such a brilliant answer. I'm not going to let you off uh, in what you just falsely described as academic humility, um, um, because there is no such thing. I want to ask you a, a, a converse question before getting back into 
our, our narratives and actually the role of some of you know some of the, the people you mentioned and uh, and the role of academics and, and and big ideas in understanding this conflict. But it's a question back as a, as a mirror image of this, because I'm very interested in your view of this, which is, what's the plausible uh, uh, minimum scenario <clears throat> on the Ukrainian side? So. What, what's 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 the scenario? Has has um, uh, President Zelensky passed that initial <clears throat> point of danger, um, whereby um, his country may collapse or he would be overwhelmed, um, to 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 reach another sort of uh, uh, potential sort of form of stasis? You mentioned a version of a, a future in which President Putin is able to declare, if you like, some form of success as per military limited military operation in the Donbass. Uh, but pr presumably that does not mean uh, the land bridge or, or, or the Black Sea. What's the minimum that Ukraine now needs to survive or enter a, a perhaps a, a, a new phase in which the intensity of the conflict is, is, is not there? And I, I ask you that with no, with no prejudice, but just the kind of the, the, the mirror image of, of, that, of that uncomfortable status quo. Is, is, that, is that obvious? Is that clear to you? Well, I am not in direct touch with... Uh, mm -hmm. President Zelensky, others uh, are, and so I have to rely on on secondhand insights and media coverage. Interestingly, from quite early in the conflict, uh, President Zelensky signaled that he was open uh, to some kind of peace deal that would take NATO membership for Ukraine off the table, a version of the, the deal that Henry Kissinger had in mind back in 2014 when he presently argued that continuing to talk about Ukrainian membership of NATO might lead to war. So the idea that I think still has some life in it is that Ukraine would enjoy a neutral status that would be guaranteed internationally rather in the way that Belgium's neutrality was guaranteed in the 19th century. I noticed also uh, just a few days ago that President Zelensky carefully uh, indicated that not all bridges had been burned uh, that there therefore is in his mind some possible path to a negotiated uh, settlement with Russia. However, one must bear in mind that with every passing uh, week of war and with every atrocity, with every school uh, that the Russians uh, strike, with every uh, uh, revelation of atrocities that have been perpetrated by Russian forces, it gets harder for Zelensky uh, to reach some kind of compromise because uh, the sentiment of the Ukrainian people has been dramatically altered uh, by this war. A nation is being born. If ever there were any doubts about Ukrainian national identity, about the viability of the Ukrainian uh, state, that doubt has been entirely uh, effaced by this conflict. I've been to Ukraine pretty much every year for the last uh, 10 years uh, and followed closely developments there. And this is uh, one of the most significant changes that the war has brought about, certainly not the one that, that Putin intended. So I think with every passing week, it gets harder for Zelensky uh, to do the kind of compromise peace deal that I thought was viable two or three weeks into the war, when it really seemed that uh, there might be a, a way out. And my peripheral involvement in those uh, efforts to find a, a, an early path to peace uh, gave me some brief glimmers of hope. It's got much, much harder now. Uh, and of course, uh, what Putin is, is talking about still seems to me far beyond uh, what uh, Zelensky can accept, because if one reads carefully uh, the transcript of Putin's uh, Victory Day speech uh, today, what he's essentially saying is that uh, the Donbass, uh, the, two oblasts of Donetsk and Luhansk are in fact Russian territory uh, and not just the relatively small areas uh, that were uh, supposedly uh, autonomous republics after the 2014 uh, invasion. So that speech, although in many ways it was a great deal uh, less aggressive than many Western analysts expected, still contained a claim that I think it's hard for Zelensky to accede to. Uh, so I think that the diplomatic room for manoeuvre is much, much uh, smaller than was the case even after two or three weeks of war. Right now, uh, the most I think that we can hope for is some kind of ceasefire, uh, which will come about mainly because 
uh, of Russian exhaustion uh, rather than of a decisive uh, military breakthrough. Okay, thank you, Neil. I'm going to ask you um, two, two conjoined questions. The first, I think, you've already given an indication of your answer to it. Um, uh, and the second um, is perhaps parochial, but may sound intellectual, which is the role of our friends and colleagues and their ideas um, about this conflict and how they've, they've borne up. I mean, the, fir the first, I think, I know your answer to this, is, is that I, I would suggest to you that from your writing and, and from what I've read and what you said already, that it's, it's slightly myopic um, and clumsy of us to characterize this as a transformative new era um, uh, since, since Putin decided to do this. And this is kind of classic sort of Western um, short-sightedness short uh, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, rushing to the ramparts of new concept, new era, when actually we've been living in an era like this um, for, for, for quite some time. So, you know, this sort of history ended on X date is actually something is, 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 um, is misleading. Correct me if I'm wrong in that, but it tees up the, the, the second question, which is, you know, who's got it right and who should we be listening to? I know there's a controversy in the United States about the ideas of John Mearsheimer. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, um, I know there are periods in which um, uh, Henry Kissinger's ideas, and of course your biographer of Henry Kissinger, or de rigueur, um, or that people studied them very carefully. Kissinger wrote an article, I think, in the New York Times early in the conflict, um, which had a, a, a different response. You have uh, thinkers like Elliot Cohen um, writing the Atlantic, who, um, in many respects, as a, as a kind of never Trump. Uh, neoconservative, I think he would self-describe as that, is not particularly fashionable in the last few years, and yet people have seized on his articles as setting a kind of a, a, a new model. Who's got it right? Who should we listen to? Or is there a different way of listening, looking at this and saying, you know, perhaps all of the above have a point and we need, we need, a, we need a different framing? And I say you mentioned some of those individuals, you talked to them as well. The, the final one I drop in is, is Francis Fukuyama. Well, I never agreed with uh, the view that that is now most closely associated with John Mearsheimer, that somehow the war uh, was all the fault of uh, of NATO uh, and specifically of, of NATO enlargement. Uh, that is, I think, a, a misreading from the point of view of the Baltic states or, or Poland or indeed any of the uh, former Soviet or Warsaw Pact countries that are now NATO members, nothing illustrates better the importance of NATO membership than what is happening in Ukraine today, uh, which is a consequence of uh, President Putin's, I think, ultimately vain dream that he can resurrect the Russian Empire, not the Soviet Union, I don't think that's what he's trying to do, but the, the Russian Empire. Uh, my view is that uh, there was a specific uh, miscalculation uh, which was made with respect to not only Ukraine, but Georgia, which was to talk about they're becoming NATO members beginning in 2008, but never to deliver on that. Uh, the worst of all possible worlds is to be uh, uh, offered NATO membership with a deadline of never. Uh, and I think Kissinger was right to say in 2014 uh, that there had to be a, a better way forward. I think if, if we were never really sincere about Ukraine's joining NATO, and I don't think we were sincere about that, uh, then I think the whole idea should have been taken off the table uh, by diplomatic means, uh, there was certainly a better way forward. And I think Kissinger was right about that in 2014, and his article from that year has stood up well. I think that the neoconservative view uh, that it's 1989 all over again uh, has found some unlikely bedfellows uh, in the Biden administration. Uh, Joe Biden's speech in Warsaw uh, which ended with the headline grabbing uh, call for Putin's removal of power, sounded uncannily like uh, some of the things that Francis Fukuyama has been writing. Now, Frank is a good friend and, and a colleague here at Stanford, but I was amazed when he run, ran into print early in the war and said, Ukraine is going to win and this is going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to have a kind of second 1989 reaffirming that the end of history is is still a viable concept, by which he obviously meant not that history was stopping, but that liberal democratic capitalism uh, had won and all alternative models uh, would fail. Now, I think about the situation very differently. Uh, I don't think it's 1989 all over again. 
And I think it was very reckless of Joe Biden uh, to make that speech. The entire speech appeared to be a call for uh, a comparable disintegration of the Russian Federation uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. I, I don't think that this is prudent given the scale, as I've mentioned, of Russia's nuclear uh, capabilities. Uh, and I don't think it's historically uh, very probable. So let me offer an alternative framework, which is one that I've uh, advocated for more than four years now. We had an interwar period after 1989-91, and that interwar period is now over, and Cold War II is underway. A Cold War II is a kind of mirror image of, uh, of Cold War I in the sense that in this uh, second Cold War, China is the senior partner and Russia is the junior partner. Uh, and in this second Cold War, the first hot war has broken out not in Asia, as it did in 1950 in Korea, uh, but in Europe, uh, in Ukraine. One cannot understand what is happening uh, in Ukraine today apart from the broader global strategic competition, rivalry between the two superpowers of our time, which are the United States and the People's Republic of China. That's the way to think about this, in my view. And we should remember uh, that if the interwar era is over and Cold War II has begun, we're at the most dangerous phase, potentially, of that struggle. Uh, because in the early phase uh, of Cold War I, uh, there were crises that by the early 1960s had the potential uh, to uh, wreak catastrophic destruction. So in, embedded in Cold War II is, as with Cold War I, the risk of World War III. That is how we need to think about uh, the, the new era we find ourselves in. And that is why ultimately the fate of Taiwan probably matters more in the great scheme of things than, than the fate of Ukraine. Uh, so I hope that's a, a helpful alternative framing. It seems to me to, to uh, match much more closely the reality of our situation uh, than the notion that we are going to reenact 1989 with regime change uh, in Russia and the breakup of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Neil. I, I will open it up um, to the audience uh, shortly. Well, I can see some people I will definitely not allow to answer a question who I used to work with. Um, it, could, it could be trouble. Um, but I'll ask you one, one sort of final um, um, question. Uh, and it's, again, it's a conjoined question. I'm very interested in your perspective um, on this, um, and I will say that I have not said much about our own UK government perspective. It's not for advisors to, to say, it's, for, it's, for, it's for, for ministers to be very clear on that, and, and they have been. But one thing I will say is that in the last few weeks in particular, uh, one thing that has been underscored for all of us working on this challenge has been the hugeness of the United States in terms of when the US gears up for uh, involvement or focuses on a question, whether it be through uh, uh, defensive support or, or whether it be through uh, work on sanctions or whether it be through um, humanitarian support. I mean, the scale is, is, is huge. So just a, a question, and, and I'm interested in, in, in your view in this. What, what from where, where you're sitting, do the roles of Europe collective, including the United Kingdom, and the role of the United States, what, what does it look like and what does it say about the US of today, the path it has chosen, about which there was nothing, I think, inevitable in the early phases of this, of this crisis. And after that, I'll, I'll open up to the ladies and gentlemen here. So you've got about a few minutes, if you can, Neil. I, I must keep, keep, keep time for questions. Well, obviously, we've seen that the, the transatlantic uh, alliance, uh, NATO, uh, is a great deal stronger uh, than President Putin assumed. Uh, that's one of the commonplaces of uh, of this year. Uh, but one needs to recognize, uh, and I'll be brief, uh, a couple of, of meaningful problems. The, the first is that uh, both uh, the US and Europe uh, expected too much of sanctions, uh, first as a deterrent and then as a weapon of war. Uh, but sanctions operate uh, relatively slowly and were never likely to cause a complete collapse of the Russian economy so long as uh, the Europeans continued to pay uh, for Russian uh, gas and oil. Uh, it was clearly uh, a mistake not to make an oil embargo a part of the sanctions regime at the outset. 
Uh, but as you know, John, uh, the German government was not prepared to do that and is still digging in its heels, uh, even when it comes to a more gradual phasing out of, of European imports of, of Russian uh, energy. The second point I'll make is that it's not clear to me uh, what the US administration's aims actually are. Uh, in my view, the big difference between 1973 and now is that in 1973, uh, the Nixon administration moved extremely swiftly uh, to end the war, uh, to make sure that the war didn't escalate. Uh, and really, we see the opposite today. It's almost as if the Biden administration wants the war uh, to keep going. It's not really present in the diplomatic uh, process. It's not using the leverage that it has over both sides. After all, as you said, it's the principal supplier of weapons uh, to Ukraine. It's also the principal driver of sanctions on Russia. Uh, but that is not the role that the US is playing. And it's a disturbing thing to me that at least some people in the administration seem to think that letting the war continue is good for the United States uh, because it, it's bleeding Russia dry. It could lead to regime change uh, in Moscow. And if that happens, it'll send a signal to Beijing, don't mess with the West. Some people in Washington clearly think that's the right strategy. And my view is that it's extraordinarily risky to let this war keep going for the reasons I've already alluded to, uh, as well as being highly economically destabilizing, uh, not just to Europe, but perhaps more importantly, to pretty much all the developing world. So my view is that the big concern is uh, is not so much mission creep uh, as a tendency for the aims of uh, the United States uh, to become ambiguous, uh, to, to talk of regime change, to say that the goal is weakening Russia. These things make it harder to end the war. And as long as the war continues, I think there is this meaningful risk of escalation, uh, which would be, I think, disastrous from any vantage point. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Um, I, we have a few minutes uh, to open up um, for questions, and I will try and take a, a bunch of them to start off with. Um, the uh, gentleman there in a uh, uh, purple jumper, I think, from here. Uh, and then, uh, just to be fair, a gentleman over on this side as well with glasses on. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Merrick, Chairman, uh, macro um, analyst. You, you spoke. Uh, you spoke, Neil, about uh, the shift from Cold War I being proxy fights in Asia and now Cold War II proxy fight, or not, not so proxy, actually, fights in, in Europe. Uh, we, know, we all know what happened to North and South Korea um, and the difficulties that has posed ever since. So is there an, is there an analogy there with think, thinking about what happens to Ukraine and how it's already divided? Or, or is that not going to settle that way? Okay, and we'll take the uh, uh, question from the other gentleman here first, yeah. Uh, Robert Tyler from New Direction, the Foundation for European Reform. Um, if we're in Cold War II, then where are our modern answers to Buckley, Kissinger, and Kennan to keep the West on focus? Great questions, Neil. Well, thanks, uh, Merrick and Robert, for those questions. Merrick, I think the analogy with uh, Korea isn't perfect uh, because, of course, uh, the U.S. led a uh, U.N.-backed coalition into that war and fought directly uh, uh, against North Korea. And then, of course, uh, Stalin uh, got Mao to do his dirty work. Uh, and so it was a proxy war for the Soviet Union, but not for uh, the United States and its and its allies. Uh, however, with that caveat, I think we could see a world, uh, an imaginable future, in which the war, rather like the Korean War, proved very hard to stop, We're still waiting for a formal peace to end that uh, war, uh, at, and ends up being a kind of messy draw uh, with a, a, a partition line of, of some kind. Uh, I've certainly heard that kind of scenario discussed by both uh, Russians and, and Ukrainians. But clearly, the, the, the fighting determines the location of the line. And whatever uh, may have uh, inspired Putin at the beginning, uh, he's clearly not in a position to achieve the, the partition of Ukraine that was discussed uh, in Russian state media early on that would have reduced... 
uh, Ukraine to a landlocked uh, rump state, uh, that's because I don't think the Russians have the capability uh, to fight and win uh, and hold on to territory uh, in the region of, of Kherson, much less Odessa. So this isn't going to be a division uh, like the, the Korean division. Indeed, I think the Russians will be doing well if they end up with any more than they started with, i.e. with any more than their 2014 gains. Uh, so in terms of, of duration, there's a parallel, but I think the outcome will not be anything like the partition of, of Korea. Robert, the, the problem in, in Cold Wars, as you suggested, is partly sustaining a domestic uh, support for the relatively high defense expenditures that you have to make if you're dealing with a totalitarian rival. And I think the United States and its allies have entered Cold War II in a less resolved state of mind than they entered uh, Cold War I. Uh, it's uh, fairly obvious that the United States is a deeply divided uh, society. Uh, you don't need me to talk about that, but if you want more detail, read The Square and the Tower, which was my book before Doom, a very polarized America in which every issue becomes uh, uh, politicized uh, doesn't seem well equipped to sustain a protracted uh, competition with China, which will require really significant investments in everything from artificial intelligence to quantum computing. And now it seems a big increase in conventional and nuclear military uh, spending. Uh, so your, your question was, how do, we, how do we deal with that problem? Uh, and I think it's hard uh, because certainly uh, the American left is uh, is not really uh, uh, open to the argument that we're in a Cold War. Indeed, every time you use the term, the left will respond by saying that you are actually just the warmonger who, uh, who in fact wants there to be uh, a permanent state of, of conflict. So I think we enter Cold War II domestically in a somewhat... A weaker state than than we entered Cold War One, and that's why, when I use this analogy, I'm not saying don't worry, uh, we always win Cold Wars. The sample size at this point is is 1.5 uh, uh, or two, but but I think the real point is that we don't necessarily uh, know how Cold Wars will turn out. Uh, in many ways, it was just luck that Cold War One did not become World War Three. There were a number of occasions when it nearly happened. Uh, and I mean, the second uh, point I'd make is that the outcome, uh, the ultimate American victory in, in Cold War I, was not something many people would have predicted in the 1970s when it seemed to be the Soviet Union that was that was winning uh, the Cold War. So if we are in Cold War II, and I think we've been in it for several years now, we shouldn't assume that it'll last 40 years. We shouldn't assume that it'll just take the form of proxy wars and technological competition. And we shouldn't assume that the West will automatically win. Uh, by, by comparison with Francis Fukuyama, I'm a great deal more pessimistic about the supposed arc of history because I don't think there is an arc of history. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Um, a, a few more hands have gone up. There's a gentleman here uh, and, a, and, a, and a lady in the front row. And apologies to others. I think that we'll have to uh, scratch it after these two, two, two questions. Can we get the microphone down the front row, front row here? Thank you. And then a gentleman in the, in, the, in the blue suit about halfway down. Thank you. Please, sir. Peter Wilson Smith from Meritus Consultants. Could you say some more about China, which has sort of had surprisingly little attention, really, in this? I mean, the conventional wisdom is that the resolve of the West in in uh, supporting Ukraine will deter China and make it more cautious over Taiwan. Is that correct? You think? And secondly, um, the, the the increasing noises about war aims in the West being to weaken Russia, you mentioned regime change and so on. Is this going to make China worried or is this an advantage to China if Russia is severely weakened and made more dependent on China? And then um, if, you, if you go for your question as well, we'll, we'll try and know if you can wrap up in, in response. Thank you. Yes, it's, um, you, you obviously know Ukraine very well. I'm just wondering, um, let's just assume for the moment that um, 
uh, Ukraine prevails. How much depth of leadership is there behind Zelensky, who you described as Churchillian, um, to ensure that there's no backsliding in any um, final outcome? Thank you. Neil? Well, thanks for those uh, questions. Uh, Peter Wilson Smith asked about China, and I'm glad you did, because uh, in my, my impression is that the discussion of uh, the great strategic questions of our time has lurched away from China uh, since the invasion of Ukraine. And that's, that's dangerous, because China's the, uh, the real uh, concern. Uh, I think it's wrong to assume that uh, Xi Jinping is watching all of this and thinking, gee, I'd better not try anything with Taiwan. I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, th the reality is that Xi Jinping's uh, rationale for his extended time in office is to resolve the Taiwan anomaly and bring Taiwan under the direct control of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. He's not about to throw that uh, goal away, especially when the legitimacy of the CCP is under great pressure from the decline in China's growth rate and the uh, ongoing problems uh, that they confront, not just with the pandemic, but with their entire system, which is uh, is beginning to malfunction in, in all kinds of ways that I wish I had time to go into. So I don't think uh, Taiwan is off the table, but I think the timetable has changed. Uh, there was some talk uh, of there being a move against Taiwan this October, uh, ahead of the, uh, the party uh, Congress. I don't think that's uh, remotely likely. Uh, Ukraine is a reminder to China that war is difficult. And if you think invading Ukraine over uh, a land border was hard, uh, an amphibious invasion of Taiwan is uh, substantially harder from a, a military uh, point of view. So if they are intent on doing this, uh, they need to make sure that they have uh, shock and awe, overwhelming force. And, uh, and of course, they lack the kind of combat experience that the Russians have. It's been an awful long time since the People, People's Liberation Army did more than, than exercises. As for the Western, uh, Western rhetoric, uh, I think that, that positively helps Xi Jinping because it reduces, just as the sanctions do, Russia's uh, autonomy and, and drives it increasingly into the subordinate relationship that I talked about. It's not as if uh, there really is great amity between uh, China and Russia. Historically, there's only been relatively few times when they've been closely aligned with one another. In Cold War One, it didn't last very long, as you all know. Uh, but the relationship between Xi Jinping and Putin is a, an extraordinarily important one. And the very high frequency of their meetings, the pre-Olympics uh, declaration of, uh, of eternal amity, all of these things mean that uh, from Xi Jinping's point of view, this is not a relationship to be discarded but it's one in which his seniority has only, I think, been affirmed. And from a cynical Chinese point of view, you are now gonna get Russia uh, cheap. You're gonna get Russian resources very cheap now. Uh, and so it's really quite a good deal uh, in that respect for China. Finally, you know, the thing about Ukraine is, is the paradox. The paradox uh, of its chronic inability to cure its own uh, malaise domestically, the problem of corruption, uh, which was the recurrent uh, topic of discussion every time I went to Ukraine. And it's uh, unexpected ability uh, to fight a war uh, of, of national independence uh, with George Washington levels of leadership and commitment. Uh, what, what I think we will see if Ukraine is not reduced entirely to rubble uh, is that uh, there will be a much more meaningful uh, reform era after this war. Uh, the, the transformation of Ukrainian national identity uh, that a war like this uh, is likely to bring about will mean that the oligarchic domination of the Ukrainian economy will not long survive the peace. Uh, in fact, I think there will be a positively revolutionary spirit uh, in Ukraine after this war is, is brought to an end. So I think the domestic issues that have bedeviled Ukraine uh, for so long, the, the sheer difficulty of cleaning up all those post-Soviet pathologies 
may in many ways be swept away by the, the searing uh, effects of the conflict on the Ukrainian people and, and the national uh, psychology. Uh, I know that I've got to shut up at this point, and, uh, uh, and John, I want to thank you very much for so modestly being uh, the moderator and uh, an interrogator when you really know a great deal more about what is going on right now than anybody outside government possibly can. Uh, and I want to thank you for taking time out of your obviously very demanding schedule to do this uh, conversation. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Ian Martin for inviting me to be part of this. I wish I uh, could stick around and listen to the rest of the discussion. Uh, and I hope that I've at least made some small contribution to it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, well, th thanks back to you, Neil. Um, it's always very difficult for us academics in the UK to look at these Californian backdrops um, uh, where the sun is shining. Uh, but thank you for, for uh, punishing us with that. Uh, and the real reason why I have to stop and hand over to Adam shortly is actually uh, someone asked earlier, I can't remember who asked this in the audience, where are the kind of future Cold War thinkers? Where, are, where is the kind of intellectual heft in this place? And it, it's certainly not with, 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 with me, uh, but the next sort of phase we have today, uh, and I hope you can uh, be part of some of those discussions, is, is um, with uh, war study students from King's. Uh, who've been thinking about this um, quite intently. So uh, thank you again, Neil, for a tour de force, and I will get off the stage and hand over to Adam. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.